super happy to be here. I mean, for one thing, it feels like I'm in my own living room, which is really nice. But also, um, because as I travel and people ask me what they can do to make the world a better place, I say the best thing you can do is gather together with a bunch of friends and neighbors around good, healthy food in a non-commercialized, shared, common space and talk about how to make the world better. And that's exactly what you guys are doing. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks especially to Doug and Sarah, who are hosting me right around the corner and who helped make the connections to make this possible. So I'm really, really grateful. Um, so for those of you who've seen the story of stuff, has everyone seen it? Do you all know what I'm talking about here? Good. Okay, so for those of you who've seen the story of stuff, you know that I'm really obsessed with stuff. I'm totally, uh, completely consumed by stuff, actually. Um, I'm so obsessed with stuff that I really did spend over a decade traveling the world to look at firsthand what the factories where our stuff is made and the dumps where our stuff is dumped. I mean, I went to factories in Haiti and China and Pakistan and dumps in South Africa and Indonesia, like all over the place. I actually saw a lot of Australian waste when I was doing that too, by the way. Um, but what happens when you spend a decade going around the world looking at factories and dumps is you develop this weird kind of neurosis that whenever you look at something, its entire life cycle flashes through your eyes. So I'm looking at this microphone and I'm like, oh, the metals that were probably mined in Africa, the plastic was probably synthesized in Gujarat, it was probably put together in some factory in, in China. I'm imagining the packaging and the trucks and the trees that were chopped down to make the packaging and the ships. And it's like constant. And that's why I look kind of a little disoriented sometimes. <laughs> um, it is, it is a, it's a fascinating neurosis to have, and if any of you are looking for a neurosis, I just recommend you give this one a try. Because it's, it's just a super interesting way to go through the day. You will never be like, what should I think about? Because you just, <laughs> just look in a bin and see, you'll have a lot to think about. It's fascinating. Um, it is disorienting, it's stunning. I always have to tell my mom, I'm not stoned, I'm stunned. I mean, it's just stunning. Um, but it's a little bit lonely sometimes. Because if you haven't noticed, the mainstream media is talking a lot about stuff, but not where it comes from and where it goes. And so that's why I made the Story of Stuff film. I wanted more people to join me in this conversation about where our stuff comes from, where it goes, and most importantly, how we can do it better. And so I made this film, put it online in um, 2007, December 2007. I hoped, I was like praying that I would get 50,000 views. I said, if, if 50,000 people watch this film, we can really turn the volume up on this much needed conversation. So to my utter amazement, we got 50,000 views in one day. We, we are stunning. We're now at um, over 13 million views online. Um, it's interesting, it's, it's kind of creepy, but it's interesting. You can go to Google Analytics and see a map of the world and see a dot everywhere someone has watched it. And it is now the entire world except one country in the middle of Africa, and I keep meaning to send them a DVD, because then we will have it covered. Um, it's, 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 it's been enormous, a huge viewership from Australia. And that's really why I came. I'm, I came technically because a wonderful organization called the um, SSEE, the Society for Sustainability and Environmental Engineers, totally cool engineers, the coolest engineers I have ever seen. They're Australian, you guys are so lucky. Take care of these guys and protect them because they are trying within the engineering um, culture to change the dominant paradigm from one of dominating Earth to working with it. They really need our support, so just remember that name, SSEE. These guys are super cool and they need, we need to have their backs because they're trying to build a more sustainable future. Anyway, they invited me, but the, it doesn't really make sense to fly around the world to give one talk, so the reason I accepted that invitation is because I wanted to meet all of you. We have such a huge viewership from Australia. We get incredible, enthusiastic letters and invitations all the time from people in Australia, so I was so excited to be here. Um, the breadth of the response to Story of Stuff surprised me, as well as the diversity. I mean, it's just amazing that diversity of people we've reached. We've reached people who are longtime activists who said, I knew that, I just didn't know how to say it. Or I didn't know how to say it quite as quickly, but I knew that, but I didn't know how to say it. Or, or I knew a piece of it, but I didn't know how my piece fit into a broader system. We also got messages from people brand new to this stuff. I got a lot of emails from people who said, I wouldn't have even watched your film if I had known what it was about, but it changed my life. <laughs> my favorite was a woman who said, I'm a Republican SUV driving housewife in Texas. And she was one who said, I wouldn't have watched your film if I had known what it was about. She said, changed her life. She can't think about anything the same anymore. She said, I usually take my two teenage daughters to the mall every Saturday. What should I do instead? You know, it's amazing, the openings. Also, in terms of age, the difference is interesting. We got, one day I got an email from a fourth grader who had seen it in her school, and she said, your film is totally awesome, and she had like six inches of these smiling, flashing emoticons. 
And the same day I got an email from an Oxford economics professor saying he uses it in all of his postgraduate economics classes. I mean, just today I met a kid who, who heard about the film from his chaplain at school, and I met somebody who's using it in um, business sustainability courses. I mean, it's just really inspiring that we have tapped into something so um, universal. People often um, congratulate me for making a viral film, and I just wanna say, I made a film, you guys made it viral. You cannot make anything viral without the community, so just an enormous heartfelt thank you for sharing it, for giving it to your family and neighbors and, and schools and colleagues, I really appreciate it. Um, it is humbling to have 20 years of research distilled down into a 20 minute cartoon, um, but I can distill it down even more. And one of the things I've learned from this experience is it's really important that we distill it. I think environmental activists often get in our own way. We are really stuck in this myth that the truth will set us free. And that's a, it's a myth because if the truth would set us free, we would be free because we have all the truth. We have all the data and charts and graphs to prove it. But it will not set us free. And in fact, it gets in our way. I, I find that we tend to be kind of a whiny and wonky bunch and we wave our charts and graphs in front of people and talk about carbon sequestration and parts per million and endocrine disruptors and all this stuff. And we're waving it in front of people's faces and we're wondering why they don't invite us to their parties. It's like, <laughs> it's not that fun to have like all this guilt and fear and charts and graphs and data, um, we need to really distill down what we're talking about to more fundamental truths that we can connect with people around. Because what will set us free is not yet the next more precise piece of data. What will set us free is building communities and building a broad, inclusive, diverse movement for sustainability and justice. And that is what will set us free. So in distilling it down, I can really distill down the problems into three things. There's just three things that we need to solve. It's really not that complicated. The three things are, we are trashing the planet, we are trashing each other, and we are not even having fun. Now, that third one to me is the real kicker here. Um, because if it was fun, if this current economy, if the, if the way that we organize our materials and economic economy right now, if that was working for the majority of the world's people, we might want to have a different conversation, right? We might want to talk about how to prop up an inherently unsustainable system as long as possible. Or if it was really, really fun, we might say, you know, let's just go down in flames, but at least we're enjoying the ride. But the bummer is we are going down in flames and the vast majority of us are not really enjoying the ride. So the time is so ripe for something different. And that's what we're seeing in these incredible Occupy events all over the world and transition towns all over the world. And in so many other ways, people are saying it's not working. Let's do something better. So let me just briefly talk about each one of those. The, the trashing the planet part, it's we are using too much stuff. I know you guys all know this. We are using too much oil, too much coal, too much water, too much soil, too much. We're using too much stuff. Um, the best overall measure of this is the um, Global Footprint Network that looks at how much humanity is using each year compared to how much the planet produces. They now say that we're using one and a half times what the planet produces and what the planet can assimilate each year. So one and a half times what the planet can produce. I was at a scientific conference recently and I told this number, and I swear to God, a debate broke out. And some people said it's 1.3 times and some people said it's 1.6 times. And they started yelling and I was like, you guys, you are missing the big picture here. <laughs> Anything over one is a problem. <laughs> it doesn't really matter how much. Uh, we have got to start bringing that down. Um, Global Footprint Network actually tracks the day each year by which we've used that year's worth of the planet's productive capacity. It's called Global Overshoot Day. This year it was in August, it was August 21st. So from then on out, we're basically consuming on credit. We're consuming into the stockpiles that nature has had eons to develop, which means that we're undermining the planet's ability to produce for tomorrow when we're gonna have even more people. So I think Global Overshoot Day is a fascinating day, and it doesn't get a lot of press, so that's a great time to write op-eds, letters to the editors, blog about it, do whatever you can, but that's enough on that. At this point, to not know we're using too much stuff, you have to be living in a cave or working for Tony Abbott. So <laughs> the sex, second thing is that we are trashing each other. We're trashing each other in two ways. Um, one way is with the um, amount of toxic chemicals that we use in our industries and put into the things that we bring into our homes and schools and churches and workplaces and bodies. I mean, there are, we routinely use chemicals that cause neurological problems, reproductive problems, cancer. It's just, we use them so much that it's just become normalized. I actually read an article about what day of the week your corporate CEO should announce that he has cancer to have least impact on the stock prices. I mean, it is absolutely disgusting. It's just become so normalized. Um, 
It's, it's so prevalent now that every single person has a, a level of toxic chemicals in their body. It's called a body burden. It's what we all carry. Um, and some people say, well, can't we solve this by eating organic and buying less toxic sunscreen and shampoos and all that stuff? And I hate to tell you, but we can't solve it through that. Those are absolutely important things to do. And definitely we should eat organic. Definitely we should buy the least toxic products available. That's important for sending a message through the marketplace about what we want. It's important for protecting the workers and the host communities around these factories. But don't delude yourself to think that all you need to do is make a little organic bubble around you and you will be fine. I am a, a perfect example of that because I am super uptight about toxic chemicals. I am like so vigilant and uptight and neurotic. I would not wish my level of uptightness upon any of you about toxic chemicals. I screen everything coming into my house. There is no PVC. There are no BFRs. There is no Scotch guard on the carpets. There's no Teflon frying pans. I mean, there's, I'm really, really strict about it. I have, have organic food and everything. I even buy my furniture used so that it off gassed at someone else's house. I'm like <laughs> super strict. And so I was curious to see what was my body burden like being as, as uptight as I am. For years, also been a vegetarian for 20 some years. Also. So I had my body burden tested, and my body is loaded with toxic chemicals. My body is loaded with chemicals that I never gave permission to any company to put inside me, that I never knowingly ingested. Now, you talk about a fundamental trespass. What the hell are these chemicals doing inside me, and who gave them permission? I mean, it is an absolute moral as well as public health outrage. Do you want to know how bad it's gotten? The Environmental Working Group did a study of the blood of umbilical cords of newborn babies. They found an average of 260 industrial and agricultural chemicals in the blood of newborn babies. You cannot blame that on lifestyle choices. They just got born. So if we have reached the point where our babies are being born pre-polluted into that world, poor little Miko might be the seventh billion person, he's also the seventh billion toxic person. They are born pre-polluted into this world. Isn't that time to draw a line in the sand and say, get the toxic chemicals out of our stuff. Get it out of production. It is absolutely possible. If it wasn't possible, if, if the choice was toxic stuff or no stuff, we might reconsider. It's absolutely possible to massively reduce the toxic chemicals in our industry. And that's what we need to be focusing our energy on, not just buying green. So that's one way that we're trashing each other. Another way we're trashing each other is on the equity front. While some of us have so much stuff, we are just saturated with stuff. We are burdened with stuff. There's an explosion in my country of mini storage sites because we have too much stuff even for our gigantic houses and three-car garages. I mean, we are burdened with stuff. Other people on the planet don't have enough stuff for even basic survival. We've just reached the point, the milestone for the first time in human history that one billion people are chronically hungry and one billion people are chronically obese and overweight. You know, so we, it's really important to keep this equity piece in mind because we often talk about the answer is to consume less. The answer for some people is to consume less, but some people need to consume a whole lot more, even to meet sort of basic levels of survival. So we just need to keep that in mind when we're advocating less consumption. We're advocating less and more equal consumption. That is really key. And it's not just an ethical issue, even though I think there is enormous ethical dimension to that. And there's a lot of data that's been summarized in a recent book called The Spirit Level. And they mean spirit like, it's not like hippies, it's like spirit like a um, carpenter level, you know, this level thing that sees how even things. So this book is called The Spirit Level. And it's about um, how more equal societies do better. Societies that have greater equality, people are happier, people are healthier, education is better, the environment is cleaner, people are more satisfied with things and there's less overall consumption. So combating economic inequity is not just the right thing to do from a justice perspective, it's the right thing to do from a health and environmental perspective as well. So let me just talk for a minute now about the um, we're not happy part, because that's the part that often surprises people, because how can we not be happy? Like, we have really cool stuff. We have more cooler, fancier, multifunctional stuff than any previous generation. So how is it that we are not happy? Now, this, this is more profound of a problem in my country, but the data here is that you're also beginning to experience some of these declines in happiness. So I started to look at the science of happiness. There's this whole emerging field, the science of happiness, which is just fascinating. And it turns out that once your basic needs are met, once you have food and a roof and stuff, the things that actually make you happy are not things. It's, if it's not an iPhone 5, it's not a car, even if it's a hybrid, it's not things. It's very, very consistent across age groups, across um, ethnicities, across income groups. Once your basic needs are met, the things that most contribute to lasting happiness are the quality of our social relationships, Everyone's nodding because you know this is true because like look how fun this is. Um, the quality of our social relations, um, leisure time with friends and family, um, it's having a sense of meaning or purpose in your life beyond yourself, 
and it's the act of coming together with others towards shared goals. Those are the things that most contribute to our happiness, yet the dominant message we're getting in this consumer-frenzied society is to neglect those things, undermine those things, work harder and harder and harder, get more credit card debt, buy more and more and more stuff because that will make us happy. So we're actually undermining the very things that make us most happy. Again, I find that um, just an enormous opportunity because if this was really super fun to trash the planet, it'd be harder to get people to engage. But if it's not that fun, why not try something different? A great measure of this, if you're interested in this happiness stuff, is um, the Happy Planet Index produced by the New Economics Foundation in London. They um, look at two different sets of data. They look at overall well-being, which they um, do as life expectancy times life satisfaction, over how many resources a country uses. So it's basically a measure of how efficient a country is at converting natural resources to human well-being. So in their most recent one, out of 143 countries, my country ranked 114th, yours ranked 102nd. So while you're better than us, you're happier than us, you still a lot of room to move up. So check out the Happy Planet Index if you're interested more about that. Um, and there's some excellent work being done around happiness initiatives about how to get your local government to take happiness into account in making policies. If anyone wants to talk more about that, I'd be glad to talk about it. Um, the country that was first this last year was Costa Rica, which is worth noting decided to abolish their offensive military and convert all of those resources into human and environmental well-being. And you can buy a lot of human and environmental well-being if we got rid of our military. So that, that's something we ought to add to our list. You know, I don't know where Bhutan was on there. The reason I'm asking about Bhutan is, if you know, Bhutan has a, a metric, the gross national happiness. You're all nodding. You guys all know this stuff. Okay. <laughs> So um, that's the good news, is that there is you know, basically nowhere to go but up and so many ways to make things better. Um, and one of the other things I learned in my years of research on this, not only are we trashing the planet, we're trashing each other and not having fun, but it doesn't have to be this way. There are so many solutions. There are so many ways we can make things better. I was just with these engineers who said that with existing technologies, not even new stuff, which is being developed every day, with existing technologies, we could reduce carbon by 85% by 2050. I mean, existing technologies, there's green chemistry, there's zero waste technologies, there's biomimicry, there's just an unbelievable number of, of technical solutions, policy solutions, cultural solutions that can solve this problem. There's so many ways that we can get involved. I think you guys already know all that, so I kind of want to instead give you guys my insider information. If this is what I, the information that I share with people who are already on board with making the planet better. In making the story of stuff, I got three takeaway lessons that I didn't realize in my years of working on this that really have helped me as an activist and I want to share them with you. Because there's lots of things we can be doing. There's three things we must be doing better than we're doing now. So the, the first thing is that we need to get better at talking about the issues that we care about. Um, that earlier I said that we too often get in our own way. I just want to give you the story of where I learned about this because it really was um, transformative for me and this is what led me to make the story of stuff. So you guys get that I'm like really into stuff and t I'm like a bit of a wonk and technical person and I actually have on my night side books like Materials Flow and Industrialized Economies and I love that stuff. Um, and I, for years, was operating under the mistake that the more that I learned about this, the more effective of a communicator I would be. The smarter that I got about this, the more I would be able to get people to join me. And so I read every single book there is about chemical pollution and garbage management and all this stuff, and I bombarded my friends and neighbors with this stuff constantly. Um, and and I would, when they would, wouldn't respond, I'd be like, I'd bombard them more. I'd try a different approach. I'd show them new graphs. And so the, I remember so well the moment I realized this. I took this training program in, in 2005 called the Rockwood Leadership Training Program. If you're ever in the U.S. with a few extra days, take one of these. It's a great program for social change activists. And in my program, there was, we met Rockwood, the Rockwood Leadership Program. It's an amazing act, um, program. I did the year-long program. They also just have three-day programs. They're all over the U.S. all the time. So if you're planning a trip there, check it out. But I did the year-long program where there were 20 activists, very, very diverse activists, like the head of Move On, um, the head of the largest gay rights group in the country, uh, an African-American minister from Alabama working on poverty alleviation, like really diverse, not all greenies at all. So um, one of the things we did in that um, program was talk about how important it is to stay connected to your purpose in your work. Um, and then we, we stood in front of the group and gave a talk about what our purpose was. And we had given the group permission to give us authentic feedback. Now that's really important to do because we don't give each other authentic feedback about how it's working. And the only vehicles we have to change the world is us. So we need to keep improving our skills. 
So anyway, I stood up there. I was really confident because I know a super lot about systems of production and consumption and garbage and all this stuff. And I thought, this is my chance to recruit all these people to join me. So I stood up there and I gave my most advanced, most technically sophisticated, most big word filled talk I could possibly give. Because I thought at some subconscious level that if I showed them how much I knew, they would want to join me. So I said, my purpose in life is to bring about a paradigm shift in our relationship to materials. And I went on this whole thing about how um, endocrine disruption and carbon secret trace sequestration and we used too much materials, we used too toxic materials, blah, 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 all this stuff. And I was very confident at the end. And um, I am so grateful to this guy, Eli, who's he's the head of Move On. You guys know Move On? Like, the guy is a smart guy. He, he raised his hand and he said, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> and then there was a thing you were supposed to do if you agreed, and the whole entire room did this. And I was shocked. I mean, the only critical feedback I had ever gotten was that I talked too fast. That's the, only, that's the only thing anyone told me. So I was stunned. I said, what is there to not understand? We're using too much materials. We're using too toxic materials. And Eli said, I don't have anything to do with materials. I work on democracy. I said, that has everything to do with materials. Who do you think is making decisions about what materials we use? He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, what is a material? And I said, it's everything. Look around you. And he was looking around. <laughs> And I said, it's what you're holding, it's what you're sitting on. And I will never forget, he looks down, he looks back up and he says, he says, no, Annie, I'm sitting on a chair. I said, oh. I said, is that what your guys' brain does when you see that? And they said, yeah. Um, they, said, <laughs> they said, what does your brain do? And I was like, it looks like mahogany or teak, it's from Indonesia or Malaysia, I wonder if the banana people got kicked off there, it looks like PVC, it's listening phthalates, it's endocrine disruptors. Anyway, so I did that thing I do all the time. And they said, um, they said, Annie, you need to get out a little more often. <laughs> um, and they told me some advice which changed my life, and so I want to share it with you. They told me that all of my jargon and expertise was actually serving to exclude them from the conversation. I thought I was impressing them and would make them want to engage more. They said it was excluding them. It was making them feel dumb and that they, were, they would have to pause to figure out what I was talking about. And by then I was like eight sentences away. So I was losing them by doing all this expertise. I realized that experts and expertise should be on tap, not on top. We, we need to know that stuff, but we don't lead with it. That's not how we connect with people. They told me that um, I was starting the conversation 20 years into it. They said they surprisingly had not spent 20 years going to factories and dumps in <laughs> Pakistan and stuff. And they said to start at the beginning. Um, they also told me to lower my center of gravity, that I was totally in my head. And they said, come down to the heart and take the time to connect with people. And I was like, there's no time. The planet is dying. We have to <laughs> Um, and so I, I really took that information to heart. And we met four times over the years. Oh, I have to, you guys know Van Jones? Van Jones, great green job activist. He was there. He said, I never want to hear you say paradigm shift in relationship to materials in public ever again. <laughs> so funny. So over the course of the year, we got to practice different ways of talking about it. And on the, the third one, they were like, you know, you're a little better. But they said, we don't think you're ever going to be able to talk about this in a way that people who are not already talking about it are going to want to listen. I said, you guys are the only ones I know not already talking about it. And they said, that's part of the problem. <laughs> they said, you know, get out more. So on the last of the four sessions, I put this big piece of butcher paper up because they kept, they kept saying, start at the beginning. And I drew a picture of the earth. And I said, all right, here's the beginning. And I just did the story of stuff off the top of my head. And they loved it. And they, I couldn't believe it because I was kind of joking, too. And, um, and they absolutely loved it. And that's um, how the story of stuff was born. So that is my first really important lesson that, uh, that I want to take home is that we need to know the science. We need to know the technological stuff. But that is not how we're actually going to engage people in this because the truth will not set us free. Um, the second piece of advice that I want to share. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're, not, you're not saying you have no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> Um, okay, so the, the second thing I want to talk about is that we need to think bigger, we need to be more courageous, we need to be bold and visionary in what we're asking. I'm seeing with a lot of environmentalists around the world, especially the professional, you know, white collar NGO ones that sit in offices all the time, that they have been hampered by this sort of cu um, culture of caution that we are afraid to appear unreasonable, that we are confusing political reality with physical reality. So we're asking for tiny little changes when what we actually need is a fundamental transformation of the economy to be sustainable and just. We need to basically push reset on the whole thing. And these tiny little things we're asking for are not gonna get us there. I really saw this in the um, cap and trade issue. So I don't know if you've seen, I made a film called The Story of Cap and Trade. Um, what happened there is I had made the story of stuff, it was in, just getting enormous attention. And so some activists that I knew in less industrialized countries came to me and they said, we're concerned about the primary 
false solution being put on the table for, for carbon reduction, which is cap and trade, which is a market-based mechanism that allows companies to keep polluting and get credit for it. Um, and they said, we're concerned that the international equity issue is not being, there's no space in the discussion for it. And the main proposal in the United States and internationally um, in Copenhagen, and I understand here, is for this cap and trade market-based mechanism. And so they said, can you, can you do a story of cap and trade? And I was like, a story of cap and trade? That sounds really good. Um, so I said, let me find out what other folks are saying. So I called up a bunch of environmentalists who work on this issue because um, I, I'm not a cap and trade expert. And it was so depressing. I called all these big environmental groups who've been working on climate for years. They knew how serious the science was. Every single person told me the exact same thing. They said that, um, the cap and trade does not match the science. It will not solve the problem. It doesn't get us anywhere near where we need to get in terms of actual change. They said that cap and trade disproportionately benefits big polluters and disproportionately impacts poor and marginalized communities that are already being impacted, but it's the best we can get. I got this call after call after call, every single person. I got so frustrated. I said, maybe it's the best we can get because that's all you're asking for. And I was just reading this um, history of the civil rights movement in the United States and reading about the, um, the vision of the leaders and the incredible ability for people to come and like do the Montgomery bus boycott where they walked to work for a year. I mean, that is a significant um, sacrifice that they did that willingly. And I thought, God, how were they able to get people to walk to work for a year when we can't get them you know, to ride a bike to the corner? Like what? <laughs> and I realized that they did, Martin Luther King did not stand up and say, I want a 5% reduction in segregation every year through 2050. <laughs> You know, he stood up and talked about the vision of justice for everybody. And I worry that we are, we're losing our courage to do that. So I say, now is the time to be bold. Now is the time to risk being called unreasonable, because the people who are unreasonable are the ones that think we're gonna solve this problem through these tiny little reductions. Now is the time to stand up and speak for what we know is possible and is necessary, which is nothing less than sustainability and justice. And we will take nothing less than that. So that's my second piece of advice that I learned. My third piece of advice, and this is the last one, and we'll have a discussion, um, is, is that I'm, I learned and I'm deeply worried that we are forgetting how to make change. Now, generally, I'm very optimistic about the state of the planet because there are so many things we could do better and so many people who care. But there is one big threat that I don't know if we're going to overcome. I hope we do, which is that we're forgetting how to make change in a democracy. And I see this because I go all over the world, but especially I've been focusing on the U.S. lately just because the U.S. is crumbling before our very eyes. Um, but I show that story of stuff film, and for those of you who've seen it, you know it lays out a very broad, very systemic critique. There's a lot of problems there. I cannot tell you how often someone raises their hand and says, so what should I buy then? Or you know, say, what should I buy to solve this problem? Or sometimes people raise their hand and say, what can I do to help? And I'm curious to know what people are thinking about in different places. You know, I've been all over the U.S. and places I never had been before, so I want to know what they're thinking. So I ask them, well, what can you think of to do to help? And they all have all these eager lists. I can ride my bike. I can carry my own bag to the store. I can carry my own bottle. I can buy organic. I can recycle. I can turn off the water when I brush my teeth. I can turn off the light when I leave them. It's all these I, I, I. And they're all like lifestyle choices. They can make different lifestyle choices. And those things are all excellent, excellent things to do. And I hope that we all use clotheslines and carry our own bags and all that kind of stuff. Those are excellent things to do. But those fall in the category of responsible household maintenance and adult functioning. Those do not <laughs> fall in the category of collective systemic transformational change, which is what our planet calls for. Um, and I understand why we are thinking this, because we are bombarded with these stupid lists of 10 simple things you can do to save the planet. And um, I just saw a magazine the other day that the front page said six ways to save the planet. I'm like, oh, it's gotten easier. <laughs> it's only six now. And someone literally sent me a book that's called How to Save the Planet Without Leaving Your Desk. I was like, well, the first thing you should do is leave your desk. So <laughs> this is dumb. <laughs> But um, I've come to realize that we each have two different parts of us. We have a consumer part of ourselves. It's like a consumer muscle and a citizen muscle. And the consumer muscle is spoken to and validated and nurtured so much from day one. And anyone with a kid knows it is from day one. We are trained in how to be good consumers and we're really good consumers. Like we know how to do it. We know which stores to go to which day. 
I know you could get on your little things right now and order any product in the world and get it delivered to your house by tomorrow, maybe even here by the time I'm done talking. Like is, we know how to be good consumers. And so we stay in that realm too often because that's how we're spoken to. I mean, so much that the word consumer and human being are used interchangeably. So we're, we're spoken to there, we're validated for staying there, but also we know how to do it. So it's, it's comfortable and it's easier because we're familiar with that. But at the same time, our citizen muscle is atrophying. So we're forgetting how to make change. So when we are talking about the biggest crisis humanity have ever uh, faced, the disruption of our entire global climate, like this is really, really big, or growing inequity. In the United States now, the 400 richest people have as much wealth as the bottom 1.5 million people. We have, we have higher inequity than any other industrialized country in the world right now. It is just obscene. These are huge environmental and social problems. Babies being born already with toxic chemicals. The best we can think of is we're gonna not buy bottled water, which I mean, we shouldn't buy bottled water, but those, <laughs> those kind of things, I like to think of those things as like, um, you wash your hands after you use the toilet, you floss your teeth, you carry your own bag, you don't buy bottled water. Those are like, we're past the point where we get extra credit around those. And we need to move our discussion beyond those things into how do we re-engage as citizens? How do we build that citizen muscle, get involved in our democracy, get the corporations out of our democracy and get the people back in because that is what the moment calls for. We are beyond the carry your own bag to save the planet moment. So that's my third and most important thing is that whatever it is we are doing, whether it's promoting organic agriculture or public transportation or happiness as a policy making goal or whatever it is, we have got to look at ourselves as citizens, not just as consumers, because that's where our real power is, and then treat each other as citizens coming together in gatherings like this. And that, then we will be able to build the power to turn things around. And my final thing I want to talk about is change. People often ask me, do I think we're gonna be able to change? And I'd like to remind you, we're using one and a half planets full of resources and have one planet. Like, duh, we're totally gonna change. You cannot use one and a half planets full of resources when you only have one indefinitely. We are definitely gonna change. Change is inevitable. The question is not if we are gonna change, but how we are gonna change. We're gonna change either by design or by disaster. Those are our two options. And if we, either way, it's gonna be hard work. Either way, things are gonna look a lot different than they look now and for our parents. But if we change by design, if we choose design, we can be so much more intelligent and intentional and compassionate about it, and forward thinking. If we dig our heels in and just refuse to budge on this and say, you know, we can't afford to stop coal, we can't afford all this stuff, we are still gonna change, but it's gonna be a lot uglier, a lot less just. So the, the change is coming. I like to think of it as like a bus. The bus is turning directions, and we have the choice to be at the steering wheel or get run over. But either way, that bus is moving. So I'm so thrilled to see you all here because it is clear that you have chosen to change by design rather than disaster. And it's clear that you're already using your citizen muscles. And things like this give me hope that we can build a strong enough national and global movement to turn our countries around, get us back on the path towards sustainability and justice. And you know what is so great about doing that, about getting involved and in exercising that citizen muscle? Not just will we build the power to continue to live on this planet, which would be nice, but also remember what I said about happiness? The things that provide the biggest happiness, the, the quality of your social relationships, having a sense of purpose and meaning in your life, coming together with others towards shared goals. So getting involved to make the world better actually makes us more happy. It provides the very things that make us more happy. So it's not about, you know, come over here and we'll be eco martyrs and eat cardboard chasing veggie burgers and nag people. It's not, it's not about that. It's about come over here, we will, we'll build a movement strong enough to live on this planet and we'll have way more fun. So what's not to like about that? So thank you guys very much for coming out today. Thank you.